turning your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. And um, today we'll be in verse 7 and we'll go through 7, 8, and 9. I need to go back and plug these things in because of the fact is what we're studying right now is a series. And I know a lot of times pastors preach series, but the series that I'm preaching was laid out by Jesus himself. He had seven letters. He started with letter number one, and we go all the way back to the beginning. And I won't take long with this, but I want this to be explained so that it makes sense. Church number one was the church of Ephesus. He asked the question, dear church, he's writing a letter. Do you still love me? He goes, I, I have somewhat against you because you've left your first love. You, you've added so many other things in your life along the way that along at the beginning of your Christian life, it was about a relationship with God. But along the way of our Christian life, we add to and we leave off things that are so vital. And before we know it, the Christian life is about do's and don'ts and programs and processes and not about a relationship. He said, I wish you would go back and do your first works. Go back to the beginning when you fell in love. You see, everything that we're talking about even today doesn't make sense without first starting with a relationship with Jesus Christ. We get to church number two, and he's consider, uh, continuing this series as he says to the church of Smyrna, dear church, life can be hard. He said, I know your tribulation in that passage. Man, they had opposition. Let me tell you guys, just because you have a relationship with Jesus Christ does not mean that you won't have opposition. You're going to have it. Anytime you say, I'm living for Jesus, Satan goes, what'd you say? That, that, you know, that's, that's automatic. You say, I don't understand. As soon as I started living for Jesus, opposition came into my life. This doesn't make sense. Because that means if you're living for God, you became Satan's opposition. You stand in the way of the kids that you're standing up for, the family that you're reaching, the community that he's after. He said, life is going to be hard, but God makes a way. Don't quit. We win in the end. He, he said those things. And then the third church, the church of Pergamos. So, man, church, don't compromise. Because it's easy when things, when you have a relationship with God and things get difficult, it's easy to get off track. He confronts this church about this because we live in a world that it's easy to adapt to the culture around us. And let me tell you, when we become like the world and we become carnal, and we take our minds off God, we become ineffective of the gospel because we look like the world around us. And God says, let me tell you, the blessings that I have for you of living right are far greater than anything the world will ever give you. Church number four, the church of Thyatira, he said, dear church, who is influencing you? We talked about the importance of getting to where God wants you to be in life and being used of God. You better be careful who you date. You better be careful of the influences you have in your life, the friendships that you have in your life. Be careful. Satan will use anything to get to your heart and mind, anything to take you out. Church number five, we hit last week, the church of Sardis. He said, church, are you dead or alive? He said in that Revelation 3, 1, he said, you have a name that you were alive. He said, but let me tell you, you are dead. You know what he was saying by that passage? He was literally saying, yes, you are a Christian, but spiritually speaking, you have no life and no power. No life, no power, because those things come working of the spirit of God in your life, not what you do. We can get so wrapped up in programs and processes and so in, in our routines and our background that we forget the fact that the Spirit of God breathed into our lives. We are alive in Christ because of the working of the Spirit of God, not what we do as a building, but what we do as His people. All of these letters are a series. It's God's plan for the church because God has a big plan for His church. God has a big plan for you. And he writes all these things to set you up. He say, Pastor Tony, it's not really a setup because if God was setting us up, he dropped this right in the middle of COVID-19. God put the brakes on this thing. You know, it's not adding up. It doesn't make sense. We'll get there. We can get so disheartened. We can get so frustrated in life. You know why? Because all of these things lead us to opportunities that we get to a spot and we say, whoa, wait a minute, like we were talking about a minute ago. 
Why did God put a big closed locked door in front of me when God said that he's going to do great things? Let me explain that because I promise you this is different for all of us. When I say that I have a closed door, that that is an illustration that the Bible uses. We'll explain that here in a minute. But the idea is just something got in the way from where I need to be or what I need to do. Something got in the way. A lot of us will understand when it comes to the idea of reaching family. I'll do a survey. How many of you have somebody in your life that is lost or away from God that you have a burden for? Raise your hand. Just be honest. We're all in church. Man, I do. I've gone up to that door. I have knocked. I have pleaded. I have, I have hit it from different angles, and it's like nothing happens. And our minds almost like there's this mental block saying, God, do you not care anymore? I'm not singing the song that you're the way maker when I get to a difficulty and you don't make a way. Do you not want them saved? Do you not want them back in church? And some of us, you know, you try to get your kids back to God. Or your parents or relatives or your brother or your sister. And you say, man, it is like going up against a brick wall. There is no budge. There is no opening. I have said things. I have pleaded. I have begged. I have cried. When it comes to breaking addictions even in your own life for the lives of those that we love and you sit there and say I know what the Bible says but something in my mind tells me that God doesn't work that way anymore that maybe that God just maybe wants that to be a thing and there's no change in their life and I don't understand it I'm not just talking about in your life but maybe the life of somebody that you care about deeply but we sing the songs oh boy God, you can do anything, and God, you're an awesome God, and God, you make a way, and all this. You say, I'm saying that, but in the inside, I'm really not feeling it because I have come up against so much opposition and, and, and closed doors that it just doesn't make sense. I've thought about that even in our culture today. Where is God? I mean, if God's doing great things, then we have such a messed up culture today can get in our minds, and I'll be honest, have you ever thought that maybe we're just living in the end times and God just is showing that sin is taking over and we just have to go with the wave of this because I, I, I have no ability to change things and things are bad and raising kids is hard and we almost just raise up our hands going, well, if this is just the way that it is, I'm not praying for revival anymore because it's just not the day and age of revival anymore. Be careful of those things because they're not in the Bible. They're not in the Bible. What are we listening to? The lies that come into our mind is say that God is not able or God cannot do that or it just doesn't work that way. We get to church number six and it's the church of Philadelphia and God is saying in a mist that all these things are leading up to, hey, I have a really big plan for you. Revelation 3, 7 and to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, this church is little, it's a little city. I'm not going to go into a lot of the background of it, but it was, it was tiny. It didn't have a lot of influence. It didn't have a lot of resources. And Jesus writes this letter from his heart. You know, and I, I hope we didn't forget that at the beginning of that. I, I started off writing, reading letters that me and Jenny had to each other. And they're from our heart and from, you know, the, the, the love and the, the relationship that we had. And, and Jesus is writing a letter to us. And he said, I want you to know something. I want you to tune in. I want you to listen to what God's writing to the church, this love letter of the correction and of importance of these things that matter. And he says this to encourage them to persevere. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia, right? These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Let's lay this out with what Jesus was saying here. He said, dear church, I am working in ways that you cannot see. Dear church, I am working in ways that you cannot see. Maybe this church had the same mindset of going up against things and saying, man, God just doesn't work this way. Or they say this, which we say all the time. Where is God in the middle of all this? Because I can't see God. 
Have you ever, ever had a uh, situation in your life when you're saying, hey, I know that God's in control and I know that God's good and I know that God's faithful and you have somebody that come up to you and they say, your marriage is falling apart, you're on the, the verge of losing your job, your kids won't talk to you and they come up and say, God's working and you just want to punch them in the face. You say, I would never do it. You thought it. You might not do it, but you thought it. It just frustrates you. Don't give me that. Now, we wouldn't do that in church. We would sit there and nod our heads and say, yeah, God's good and God's faithful and God's this. But in your heart and mind, you're saying, where is God? Because all I have is disaster and I have a mess and I have frustration and I have failure and I have dead ends. And you're telling God, telling me that God's in this? What I read in the Bible about my God and what I see doesn't add up. You ever been there? God is faithful and God is true and God is, God is awesome and God is, God is a miracle worker. And then you're sitting there saying, my family is a mess. My life is a mess. My marriage is a mess. My finances are failing. It's like, no, he might be a miracle worker for everybody else, but there's something wrong with me. It doesn't work. Revelation 3.8, I need you to help me with a word, okay? I know thy works. What's the next word? Behold. Sometimes we'll get through verses and stuff like that, and we'll just kind of breeze through it. He says, I know thy works, and then he says, behold. That is a cool word in the Bible. It literally means, look, wake up, I need you to see something. It means to behold, literally means to see or to take notice or cast your attention on something. He said, I need you to see something that you are not seeing, is what God was saying by that word. I need you to pay attention to something that has not crossed your mind. You're not getting this. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. That, 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 that he said, I, look, open your eyes. I need you to see something. I need to draw your attention to something. I've set before you an open door. What was God saying? I'm doing something that you didn't know that I was doing. I'm working in ways that you did not know that I'm working. We understand in our Christian life, and we say this all the time, God stands with me. That is true. God has always been with me. That is true. I will never go anywhere that God doesn't go. That is true. But there's something, a principle that God gives us in the word of God that goes beyond what I can understand. And that is this principle. God not only stands with me, but the Bible says that God goes before me. The children of Israel uh, were called to the promised land. They went out with 12 spies. Ten were bad, two were good, Joshua and Caleb. They come back and they're murmuring and they're complaining and they're upset and they go to God, they go to the people and they say that the people are too much. So what they're saying in their mind is we've evaluated the situation, we've looked at it from every angle, I have sized them up, I've seen our people, I see what their people, I know what we have, our resources. Well, they add it all up. No, God, we cannot do this. God looks down at you and says, how do you know that? Well, God, I've done the math on it. I've figured it out. There's no way to do this. We laugh at them, but guys, we do that every day. You, you will add up things in your life, and you look at the circumstances and things around you, and you just say, God, there's no way. I'm telling you, I, I mean, with my financial situation and with what they're saying, the economy and whoever gets in the president, blah, 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 blah. There is no way, God. And God says, How? Well, God, I've done the math, and there was no way in my eyes that this is going to work out. There's no way. And, and it might not even be true, but in your mind, that affects your feelings, and that's how I feel that it's going on. God's listening to the children of Israel complain. The Bible actually says that Jesus, your God, even heard them complaining in their tents. Mumbling, complaining, we can't do this, this is terrible, I hate this, all these things. And God says something in that passage that is so important. Deuteronomy 129, he said, then, then I said unto you, dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you. According to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. <clears throat> God never said in that passage, I'll go with you. God literally said, I go before you. Have you ever thought that a lot of times, and this doesn't make sense because we try to bring God down to our level. God, I'm praying for my spouse. 
they are carnal. They're gotten away from you. They don't, there's no love in our relationship. There's no example of them living right in our home. And God, I just don't get this. God, why aren't you working? And, and God says, you don't know this about God. says, well, did you know that I brought a coworker in their life and I've been witnessing to them every day? No, God, I didn't know that because you don't know what God's doing. We do that with our kids. God, I just wish somebody, if I could get through to my kids. And God says, I've already brought a leader into their life that's witnessing to them every day and you don't even know it. God's already before you. Amen. Do you know why? Because God cares about you. God loves you. God never stops working. I think we just heard that a few minutes ago. When my kids were little, uh, it, was an, it was a normal thing for me to be able to put them through their literally five-hour routine that it took to get them to go to bed. Getting up five times, I've got to go to the bathroom again. I'm thirsty now. They tell them to get out of my room and all that other stuff. I'm thankful to be out of that stage in the, the raising of our kids. It's totally different now, but I remember going through that. And then finally, they would fall asleep, and you know, you'd step out of the rooms. And before I actually fell asleep, I would have this routine that I would go back into all of my kids' rooms, and I would check on every one of them. You say, why did you do that? Well, because I knew my kids. One of them would get out and grab a toy and be playing with it, and they'd fall asleep on that toy, and that indention would be in their cheeks and face. And I would go to the next kid, and they're halfway off the bed, and you're thinking, how do you sleep like that? Their leg is up on the headboard, and their head is down by the floor, and they're halfway off. Or the next kid, you go in there, and they fell asleep under like four levels of blankets, and you're thinking by the morning time, they're going to be sweating like crazy. So what I do, I take the toy out, and I move the kids around, and I tuck them in, and I, I, I peel off layers of blankets and things like that. Why do I do that? Because I love them. I know what's good for them. I know what they need even more than what they know what they need. And so I'm going through this because I care about them as my kids. The next day I walk in there and my kids will walk up to me and say, Oh, Father, I had the best sleep ever because of what you did for me last night. Thank you for showing your love to me when I was sleeping last night. Do you know what I actually got the next morning? Nothing. They didn't thank me. They didn't acknowledge it. They didn't come in and say, Dad, you're the bomb. You're awesome. Dad, I feel rested today because of what you did for me. You say, why didn't? They didn't know what I did. I was working in ways that they could not see because I love them. And they don't understand how much I pay attention to them and I'm around them and I'm working in their life and I care about what they're dealing with and I'm setting them up for their life to be better and they don't even know it. You say, that's a true illustration about your kids. No, that's a true illustration about us. God is always at work. God never stops working. Where is God at right now? Let me tell you. You say, where is God right now? You might not be able to see it in your mind, but God says, I'm already before you. I'm already working that situation. I know what tomorrow holds. I know what 2022 holds. I know what's beyond the election. I know what the future is. God already knows. Dear church, he said, I set before you an open door. Behold, and they're like, what? Oh, yeah. Where'd that come from? God said, I was over here working, setting this up, and you didn't even know it. Here's the second thing. Not only am I working in ways that you cannot see, dear church, I do things that you cannot do. Now, we're, we're, we're reading this from the perspective of Jesus writing to us in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, the second part of this, Jesus is speaking of himself. Listen how he describes himself. He says this. He said, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. No one, no buddy, no man, God walks up to that door and says, let me tell you what's going on right here. I'm doing things that you cannot do. I'm making a way that you cannot make. And when I do it, no man can shut it up, and when I open it, no man can close it. I am God, and don't put me on your level. God is working in ways that you cannot work in your, yourself. He says in verse 8, he said, I know thy works before. Behold, I have set before thee an open door that no man can shut. This is a visual. 
This is an illustration. Today we understand the concept of doors. We all do. You know, I know it. You got out of your, you got out of your house to come to this church. You, you shut the door. You locked it. You got into a car. You shut the door. You walked through the church. You walked through those doors. There's doors all around us. It's the idea that a door is something that leads from one place to the other. And sometimes it shuts you down. And sometimes it opens things up. I remember uh, one of my best friends, Bubba, growing up, he had this little redneck S10 pickup truck that he got. I remember saving up for it, and he got this truck. And I, I remember one time uh, that we got locked out of this truck, and I can't even remember for sure if it was his truck. I just remember the, the parallel there uh, of those situations going on. And th- he had just one way to get into his truck. The back window didn't latch all the way, so it would open up. Have any of you guys seen the size of an S10 back window? It's about this big, Okay. So we had to squeeze through that thing to get to the door because there was no way for us to do it. We're making it happen in such a way of forcing it and our abilities to make happen what I could not do and on myself by opening the door. You see, what God is explaining is he does what man cannot do. He makes a way when you're shut out of things. See, God opens doors of opportunity. See, in 2 Corinthians 2.12, Paul said, I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me. He was given this very illustration. I don't know what was going on. Maybe in our, in our mindset, Paul was saying, I'm going to Troas or I'm going to Columbus. Let's put it on our level. They don't want to hear the gospel. Man, I, I, I'm telling you now, I've been to that city. They're very distracted. They're caught up in their Buckeyes. They're caught up in their school sports. They're caught up in there. And I'm going to get there, and there's no way that I can do it. But Paul says, when I got there, what happened? God opened a door for me to allow me to go in to do something that I normally could not do. God opens doors of opportunities. You know what I've thought about us lately is how complicated life is? Can anybody agree with me that life today is just crazy? Have any of you been to the store to run in to grab something and forgot your mask in the car? And you're not so much worried and upset about the fact that you have to wear the mask. You're upset that you're running late and you got to go back to the car for the stinking mask in your car. You get inside and you're looking at things. Well, they're not social distancing and that doesn't make sense and that's hypocritical and the, you know, the, the Buckeyes can play sports or not play sports in the school, this and all. Ah, you know, we just get so angry and things are so frustrating today. Guys, it's all right for us to admit things are frustrating today. They're irritating. In our minds, Satan will come to us with the idea that God is not working and God shut things down. I can't begin to tell you guys the weirdness that I experienced as a pastor around March 13th 14th and 15th. Get a call from the governor and a conference call with us. We need churches to not meet. And the mindset's going through, and guys, I'm just being transparent and honest. It's just like, no way. No way. It's what we do. I was mad, I was angry, I was frustrated, I was confused. I'm going through my mind of, well, there's going to be some church members that say, you're just bowing to the government. Some that, like, we need to preserve life. And some that we need to be cautious. And some that say, you just don't care. And some, in all these pressures. And my heart and mind goes out to our leaders today because I understand that no matter what you do, it's wrong. There's no good answer. There's no, no right way to do it. And it's frustrating. And so I met with our deacons and we're meeting with our trustees and we're talking through all these things. And like, what do we do? You know why? Because in my mind, I know how ministry works. And in my mind, I know what needs to happen. So when my mind doesn't add up and things don't make sense, I get mad at the situation because it doesn't make sense to me. Does that make sense to you guys? I mean, do you, am, I, am I alone in this? I don't get it. I don't get it. And it upsets me. I don't want to fail God and I don't want to fail people. I don't, I don't want to mess this up. Especially if I'm supposed to be that pastor serving God in those last days. And one of the last things we did is we had, we had an Easter drama set up. Guys, 
Can you guys remember that? Before you guys came back to church, this whole thing was decked out. We had layers, and, and we had the tomb up there, and we had a script, and we had costumes, and we had sound effects, and we had video, and we had, we, we had the banner and all that other stuff. And I'm like, God, not now. This is not what's supposed to happen. And by the way, God, we do this stuff so that people would get saved, so that we would bring glory to you. I'm not doing it for myself. Cancel the drama. Cancel Easter outreach. Put everything away. Haul off dramas and props and things to a storage thing that we never ever got to use. Doesn't make sense to me. God says, I do things that don't make sense to you. I go before you and I'm working in ways that doesn't make sense to you. I open doors of opportunities. And by the way, God also closes doors of opportunity. During that time, we're living in a culture that does not pay attention to God because we are one of the most distracted cultures that have ever lived. You guys know that? Whether it's social media, whether it's sports, Columbus, Ohio, the Buckeye game comes on, and we're, we love our, our football, we love our baseball, we love all these things that go on, and we are in the middle of that time of March, what happens in March, March madness, and all that's being shut down. And all of a sudden, God begins to work in mysterious ways. I literally leave this stage where we're setting things up for the Easter drama, and I walk over to Fellowship Hall, and I'm blown away. And I'm like, what is going on? And, and Chris and them, Pastor Chris and all the, the guys got together and said, did you not hear that there's a huge problem going on where there's no food in our community? Like grocery stores are running out of stuff. They're, they're like rationing things out. There's no cleaning supplies. There's no toilet paper. I was like, what? So there's no toilet paper. I'm like, what does that have to do with the virus? And they said, well, there's no toilet paper. And I'm like, that's dumb, man. You guys know what I'm talking about? That's dumb. We look back now and like, well, yeah, that made sense. Well, no, it still doesn't make sense. Anyways, we still never figured out the toilet paper. But people needed toilet paper. And all of a sudden, I go back from off this stage that we're about to shut down, and I walked in Fellowship Hall, and these are the pictures that I started seeing uh, uh, there. Our church began to collect food. They began to work around our community and putting out things. We need food. We collected 200 bags of food because people in our community needed bags of food. We began to send out messages. We have food at Fellowship Baptist Church. We had lines of cars that literally went around our property. And one by one, we stood at every single one of those cars. And we took turns praying with them and talking to them. And I had a basket full of toilet paper. And I went up to each person and just said, this isn't much. But it's what we had left over in our church. And we're not able to have church right now. So we want you to have the toilet paper that we normally use for our Sundays. There was one person that pulled in, and they're sitting there. And they said, this is great, but to be honest, my baby is out of formula. And there is no way that I can get it in any stores. She can only have one kind of formula, and we are shut down, and I don't know what to do. And they are literally crying because they know the next phase of this is she's going to go hungry. And go to Walmart, go to Kroger, go to there. There is nowhere. We went back inside the church and some of our ladies dug through all the stuff that there. And guess what we found in the middle of that? A canister of that exact food, of that exact formula of what they needed for their baby. And we went out there and gave that to them. And they're crying saying, why are you doing this? Because we care about you. Can I tell you that we would have never made those connections if I would have went forward with my plan? From there we began... Pastor Chris had this idea, and he was sitting in a staff meeting, and he said, man, I wonder if we can just order toilet paper through our, 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 our bulk system that we here have at the church, our commercial connections. And like, I don't know. And he went on there and ordered. And he said, the order went through. Then went, guess what? It's back ordered. We're sitting there saying, oh, man, that would have been so cool if we would have had that toilet paper. One day we walk into the church. This is what we found. Cases and cases of over 1,200 rolls of toilet paper. Manna from heaven came down and sat in Fellowship Baptist Church of toilet paper. Pastor Chris and them went out and made these stickers with an invitation for them to log on to Fellowship Baptist Church to hear the Easter message that not what we originally planned to do about uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of us broadcasting and saying the simple thing that we care about you. We sent out the message over uh, tons of people from our church came, gathered those rolls, and went from door to door, inviting people to church with a roll of toilet paper. 
Now, guys, 10 years ago, if I would have said, we're going to use toilet paper as a campaign to get people saved, you would have said, you, you have lost your mind, dude. <laughs> God works in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. During this time, we began to do online services. During this time, the Columbus Dispatch actually called us up and says, hey, we heard you're doing this, and a lot of churches are debating what to do. Can we do a story on you? They came to my house, recorded me, recording my message, and then did a story about Fellowship Baptist Church giving the gospel out through the internet. And they said, what are, are you upset about what's going on? And I said, listen, I can't, things are out of my control. All I'm doing is the best that we can do for the glory of God in the middle of this situation. During that course, we were able to do all sorts of online services, getting the gospel out in ways that we couldn't. I remember one of the pictures, we had this graphic that was, came up after we were done with the service, and it says, if you gave your life to Christ today, will you let us know? And we had six people that raised their hand digitally on that screen to say, I gave my life to Christ in that one day. Hey, you know what? Praise God for that. During that time, we were doing, able to do online kids programs that literally got shared. And I, I kid you not, around the world of what Pastor Dave did on that. We had an online date night that we were able to do about helping families and be able to pull them together because nobody was able to go out and do anything. Our teens were still able to go to camp. At teen camp, we had three teenagers accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior in the middle of COVID-19. God did that. We had the community date, uh, the community movie night where we were able to bring a big screen out there. And before they came up there, Pastor Chris was able to take a green screen and we were able to give the gospel out on the screen and be able to make it fun for the kids. And people were able to come in in the middle of social distancing of doing this. Through the middle of this, we were able to do the other things uh, of the blood drive. And I could go on and on and on of the things that we were able to do. And we were able to even rent out an ice cream truck and pay the guy to go through our community just a couple weeks ago. Pastor Chris and Jake went out and did this, going from neighbor to neighbor, just saying, we love you. We're here. We're part of the community. We care about you. Here's the thing. Just because opposition and problems come into our life doesn't mean that God's done. Amen. God works in ways that you might not ever understand, and God opens doors, and he's just waiting for us to acknowledge that God doesn't always work in the ways that you normally work. You say, man, you're almost excited about COVID-19. I hate COVID-19. I hate it. But I'm thankful that my God is bigger than any opposition that comes in my life. See, God opens doors of opportunity and God pushes through and breaks through uh, things of opposition that comes into our lives. I take, for instance, the, the children of Israel that come up against the, the Red Sea and God did all these miracle works to be able to bring them to this point. They get to that point and they're sitting there with the Red Sea saying, there is no way. I don't know I've already said this, but put this in your mind. When we got it in our mind and you say, there is no way, we forget the God that we serve. I've said this many times in the past, but please understand this. We can sing all day long that our God is a miracle worker. That God does the impossible. The only way that you will ever experience God doing the impossible is he has to bring you to places in your life that are impossible. Do you hear me? I hate this. Why am I here? This doesn't make sense. I'm not getting through. This will never happen. God says the only way you'll ever know that I am truly the God that does the impossible is I have to bring you smack up to the things that are impossible. Amen. We love to tell the stories in the Bible of God doing that. Then why do we complain so much when God does it with us? Don't ever pray, God, make me a Daniel because we don't want to be a Daniel. Don't God use me like you did Moses. God says, why? If you got to the Red Sea, you would just complain, sit down, and walk out. God doesn't care. Where is God? And I just don't understand. You're just like, you don't really want me to work that way. You just love telling the stories. We have to get to the point where this is more than a storybook. This is more than just theories and ideas. That God, through all of that, brought them to the Red Sea to be able to explain to them that I do what man cannot do. I do the impossible. I am a miracle worker. Now, guys, you are not facing a Red Sea in your life. I promise you. But you are facing something in your life. 
that you're standing smack up again saying, God, this is opposition that I cannot fix. And God simply says to us, I open doors that man cannot open, and I keep them open where man cannot shut them. I do what man cannot do. This sounds good. I've heard messages like this my whole life, and man, they're, they're awesome. I need to be reminded of what God can do. I need to know the facts of who God is. But if we're being real, living them out is a whole different story. Because we're really not seeing God do a lot of miracles. We're just not. We're not seeing revival and we look back and see the days of D.L. Moody and recently, you know, more like, you know, Billy Graham and the Crusades and hundreds of people coming to the altar and getting saved. You're saying, I'd be happy to see hundreds of people just show up. Why their own come to the altar? Where is God working? Can I show you what's missing of the application of living this out in our lives? Is in the beginning of this passage. See, he says, dear church, I'm working in ways that you cannot see. Dear church, I do things that you cannot do. But dear church, you have to trust me. You have to trust me. I labored as to how to word this point because I wanted to say you have to do it or you have to follow through or you have to... But let me give you an obvious thing that happens in this passage. Revelation 3.8, he said, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. And no man can shut it. Who opened the door? Who opened the door? Who can shut it? That's it. Only God. Here's the thing that we often overlook. Here I am, and God says, behold, I open a door. Behold, I set before you an open door. There is an open door. Let me explain this right here. We know the ideas of doors all around us, and let me put this in Baptist terms, okay? Let's say on the other side of that door is uh, steak and potatoes and dessert and cheesecake, okay? Did, you, did I get your attention now, okay? And you're like, I know he's lying. You're right. I'm just, it's just an illustration. But let's say there was steak and potato, loaded pota- potato, rolls and butter, okay? It's, it's all there. It's on the other side of that door. Do you realize when God says that I open a door and Christians are over here, the only way you'll ever experience what God has on the other side is you have to trust him enough to go through that door? Uh, You say, well, that's pretty obvious. Yeah, the idea is God promises over and over again. I I am a promise keeper. Remember that? God says I do all these things. I make promises all the time. The Bible is filled with, this is what I will do. Well, I never experienced, God says, because you never will get up to do it. You'd rather sing songs in theory about who God is rather than experience. Peter only experienced walking out of water, walking on water, because he got out of the boat. Daniel only experienced being thrown in the lion's den and God shut in the lion's mouth because he prayed and was willing to take whatever came. Moses only walked through the Red Sea because God opened it up and they went through it. Moses only experienced God's enemy swallowed up in that because they went through it. You will never experience God's blessings and God's goodness and God's miracles by talking about it. Never. God says, I open doors, but you have to get up off your pew, stop singing about it, and get it to it. You have to experience in your life. And he says at the beginning, and he gives us his own outline of what this is. And you say, what is this? It's not so much physically speaking, because a lot of times we're thinking, give me the action, give me the action. Our big battle is right here. It's right here. It's a matter of before it can get to the facts of God is a miracle worker, it's got to hit my heart. When it hits my heart, it will come out of my hands. But I promise you, most of us have the knowledge of God of all these things that he said that he would do and who he is. God, that is who you are. God says, you've got it here. But until it hits here, it will never hit here. It's got to get to our hearts before I live it out in my family, before I see God do these things. He's got it. And God laid this out so clearly in this passage. Let me show you how often God says, without faith it is impossible. Be doers of the word. Faith without works is dead. Did you notice everything that God says? Here's a fact about me. But here's a step that you have to take. Verse 7. 
God explains who he is. And the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, these things saith he. God says, this is who I am. Okay? You say, all you're doing is preaching the song. No, the song was written off of verses like this. It's Bible. It's, it's praise and worshiping God for who he says he is. These things saith he. He says this. He says, he that is holy. Now, let me explain this because a lot of times we miss this. Holy, and a lot of times that we acknowledge is saying that God doesn't sin. Is that true? Absolutely. God is far removed from sin. But did you know that the holiness of God is the number one attribute of describing our God? In the Bible, from beginning to end, if you want to know one major attribute of God, it is that God is holy. God is true. God is righteous. God is great. God is all those things. But the one thing that is unanimous of the Bible that comes together all the time is God is holy. But the word holy means separated or, 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 or above or different. That's why the Bible says to be holy for he is holy. The Bible says come out from among them and be ye separate. It's not just a matter of separating ourselves from sin. It's a matter of understanding that you are, here you are and here is God in, with everything that we deal with life. And God says here's where I am. I am not where you are at. I am not your thinking. I am not your ways. I am not what you think think that you are all of these things God says I am not these things separate I'm set apart I'm above all see here's the way that we do this is we declare him as God we have to trust him as our God we have to trust him as our God God says my ways are not your ways and I'm saying at the beginning you said there's the open door where does it start it starts with turning and just acknowledging God for who he is let me illustrate it like this. this is, Jesus gave the perfect illustration. Mary and Martha had a brother. Jesus was very close to the brother. His name was Lazarus. Lazarus was sick. Lazarus was point to, uh, point to death. They run and get Jesus and say, Jesus, if you don't come, Lazarus is going to die. What did Jesus do? He stayed. He eventually goes three days later plus, shows up at the house. He said, Jesus, if you would have been here, he would not have died. You know what he's saying? God, we had it all figured out and it's past the point of return now. You messed up. God, in my mind, I needed you yesterday. I needed you to be able to heal my brother and we would not be here because that's what makes sense to me. But you see, God's plan was not their plans and God's ways was not their ways. And by the way, God's timing is not your timing. Because Jesus wasn't late in that passage. He was right on time to do what he planned to do in that passage. He was not on time to do what they thought Jesus should do in that passage. You know what we do with the holiness of God? We try to bring him down to our level and explain to God that how it needs to work. God, I need you here yesterday, and I need you to give this check at this time, and I need a raise, and I need, I need, and God, if you don't do it, I don't know where God is. God is doing his thing, not your thing. Amen. That's what's going on in that passage. God is working in ways that you don't understand. We have to trust him as our God and stop trying to bring God down to our level and our timing. God did amazing things. You know why God did amazing things? Because God brought them to an impossible situation. Pull back the stone. They said, Lord, uh, can we have a talk with you? He's dead and he stinks. You know, it's like, God, you have no idea how far past hope that is. And God says, well, then I'm right on time because uh, I am a miracle worker. Amen. I do what you cannot do. And God works in his timing. But the thing is, for all of us, we have to trust God as our God. He said, trust the one who is holy. The next thing that he says in that passage, he gives the next fact of this. He that is true. You say, how does that apply in this situation whatsoever? Do you know what often happens as I approach the things that God leads me to do? As things come into my mind that this won't work. God, I, I fear COVID-19 could be what cripples our church. God, I fear, I fear that COVID-19 could be what some of you say that I could lose my family. I could lose my home. I could lose my job. It's things that come into our mind that take us off of our attention of who he is. But can I give you the truth? 
My God never fails. My God's never not at work. My God's never late. My God is never oblivious to what's going on. My God never leaves me. He never forsakes me. My God always does good. He is always right. He's always right on time. Everything that God does. And God says, I'm going to tell you, if you're going to go through the door, you have to put in your mind what God is. And that is truth. Guys, you realize why it is so important that we do these things? It's not just a matter of knowing these things. It's declaring what is true. I must declare from my lips and declare to the enemy and declare to my heart, my God is a way maker. My God is a way maker. It doesn't matter in my mind or in the lies or what Satan does to say that it can't happen. The truth of the matter is my God has filled the Bible up with stories to tell me that he makes a way when there is no way. That is the truth that I proclaim. I proclaim it doesn't matter how impossible that looks with my family or how dead my marriage is. It doesn't matter how much the economy is crashing. My God is a way maker. We have to declare that. Do you know why it's important for us to sing songs that have the words this? When God says in this, let me tell you who I am. And he says that I am he that I am he that is holy. I am he that is this. Because God wants to declare that song that we sang. God, you are a way maker. I'm declaring in my life. As lies get into my head, I worship you. I say this. You are a way maker. God, I can't do this. This seems impossible. There is a roadblock. But I know this. You are a miracle worker. It's not always so much about the praise of God. It's a reminder of my brain. God, it doesn't make sense, and it doesn't add up, but I know this. You are light in the darkness. God, this is who you are. This is who you are, and he, he ends with one last thing, then he says that he is, and he says, he that is holy, he that is true, and he that hath the key of David. Do you know what a key is? It's referencing the authority of one has, and it uses even the example of David. David was the first king or the second king over Israel, but he was the king that loved God and God used him in great ways. And he was saying he had the authority to control and to do. God says, I am the one over your life that when it comes to whatever you're facing, you say, I can't get through that. God says, oh, by the way, I, I'm able. I have the authority. I can open up and shut down. I can get through. I can do what you cannot do because we have to embrace the fact that God is able. He says in verse 8, I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. And then he comes to a part of this passage that is one of the biggest keys of all the things that we've said, and it doesn't jump out at us. And he says this, for thou hast little strength. I'm like, what? <laughs> you are opening a door before me? Because I have little strength? Does that make sense? It would have been made way more sense for God in that passage to say, because I have empowered you greatly and you can do whatever comes before you. That's not what he said. He said, I'm going to do and bring you through that because you have little strength. Now you've got to take it in context of what the Bible says about that. Paul gave the same illustration back in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He said, he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I'd rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ might rest upon me. You know what the problem is with a lot of us? We come to doors and I need to reach my kids. I need to fix my finances. I need to reach more people. I need to fix this. We will kick that door, beat on it, cry on it, scratch it. We, we, we've got the ram to drive through that thing and everything. And you know what? You come away from that just wounded. I need to fix this. God, if you would just, and, and it doesn't happen. We just limp away from that door just like, God, I don't know where you're at. But Paul said in that next verse, he said, Therefore I take pleasure in my infirmities and my reproaches and my necessities and persecution and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then... Then am I strong? Beaten and beaten. Wait, wait a minute. I can't open this door. I can't get to my kids' hearts. I can't change my husband. 
I can't reach a hard-hearted generation. I cannot fix my finances. God, why did I think that I could do this without you? When did I ever think that you had to work in my way? So I acknowledge this, that you are a holy God. And I trust you even when nothing makes sense in my mind. And I don't even know why you shut that door. And I don't even know why I'm going through this. And I don't even know why it's now. Let's not be a Mary and Martha where we doubt God. Because he's not there yet. And God, as I approach that door, I rebuke the lies. The thing that my past has caught up with me and God doesn't love me because of what I've done in the past. That is a lie. God doesn't answer your prayers. He knows what you've done in the past. He knows how you weren't faithful to God. He knows how you cheated on your spouse. He knows that you used to do drugs. He knows you used to be a thief. He knows that you used to, it's a lie. My sin is as far as the east is from the west and God loves me with all of his heart and it is unconditional for me and I cast out that lie because you are true. And I go through that door because I know the one that opened the door is the one that had the power to make it happen. My God is able. And God will never ever lead you to fail. We're not going through COVID-19 to fail. We're going to rise up for whatever door God set before us. And it might not be my plan and it might not be my way, but I can tell you God is at work. He went before us. He set it up. He has a plan. And I'm not going to argue with God that it doesn't make sense to my little brain. Because my God is bigger than that.